Okay. So, this way we uh, ended talking about some of the results of karma, uh, <coughs> how it can, uh, a full karmic action with all the branches complete can lead to a rebirth, it can uh, influence what we experience even during a rebirth, it affects our habitual behavior, and it influences what environment we're born into. Then the question arises, well, what karma ripens first? Yeah. Because all the time we're creating karma. Yeah. We're always, you know, having intentions. Yeah. We speak a lot, we act a lot. So every day we're creating a lot of karma. And so which of these karmas are going to ripen first, uh, especially at the time of death? Okay, so Vasubandhu uh, said, actions cause fruition in cyclic existence. First the heavy, then the proximate, then the habituated, and then what was done earlier. Okay, so in general, yeah, these are general guidelines, heavy karma uh, ripens first because the intention was stronger, the object we acted on was stronger, the way we did the action was stronger. All those things we discussed yesterday that made an action heavier. So, uh, you know, at the time of death, whatever is a heavy karma is more likely to ripen first, okay? If uh, there's more than one heavy karma, yeah, in other words, they're pretty equal in weight, then the one whose potential was reinforced near to the time of death. Okay, so maybe we thought about something or we did something that reinforced uh, one or another of the, the heavy karmas. And so here also is uh, at the time of death, why our mental state is important, because that will influence what karma ripens. Mm -hmm. So we want to, if we're uh, with somebody who's dying, to help the room be peaceful and quiet, uh, to not have people surrounding the dying person who are crying, who are asking them to sign their will. <laughs> <laughs> You know, all this other kind of stuff. But to keep it very, very peaceful, to remind the person of virtuous attitudes and so on. Okay. Then, okay, if all the potentials are equal, then the action that is more habitual will ripe, ripen first. So like we talked about yesterday, we may have some habitual actions, but the actions themselves are not particularly powerful, or our motivation isn't particularly powerful, but the fact that we do them again and again makes the action strong. So, for example, idle talk, you know, we may idle talk a lot, there may not be a real strong motivation, but we do it so often that it, it makes it strong. Or, uh, remembering to offer our food before we eat. Yeah, we may not always, you know, have a really strong motivation to do it, but just the fact of remembering to do it, having some motivation, and we eat a lot, so that uh, gets reinforced. That makes something weightier, and it's more likely to ripen first. And then, um, if those, uh, the habituated actions are all equal, then the one uh, that will ripen is the action that was created first, so the earliest, the earlier action that's been sitting in the mind stream uh, for a longer time. That one will ripen first. Okay. Now, um, okay. So we have the karma ripening at death, 
which of course is very important because that will influence what we're reborn as. But we have karma ripening all day long too. Okay? We had breakfast this morning. Yeah, that's the ripening of virtuous karma we created in the past. Okay, we live in a, we're in a peaceful country now. It's the uh, virtu ripening of virtuous karma that we created in the past. Maybe you also have a stomachache. That's the ripening of non-virtuous <laughs> karma in the past. Okay, so uh, all day long karma is ripening. And then as we discussed yesterday, how we react to the experiences we have creates more karma. Okay. Um, okay. So then there's uh, a section that talks about definite and indefinite karma. Okay. So uh, it says uh, some actions are definite to produce a result unless that karmic seed is impeded from, ripe, from ripening. So in the case of negative karma, it's been purified. In the case of positive karma, we've generated wrong views and anger, and that's interrupted the ripening of the karma. So some karmas are definite, and others are indefinite, in that they're producing a result uh, at a certain time or in a certain way is not uh, is in more indefinite, okay? But as also as we talked yesterday, <clears throat> the uh, karmic seeds on our mind stream don't get lost, and they will ripen, okay? So don't think indefinite means, uh, okay, uh, yeah, they kind of slipped away and I can forget about them. It's not like that. Okay, so definite karma are actions that have been done and accumulated. Okay, so um, I'll explain those two terms in a minute. So their results are certain to be experienced unless they're purified or obstructed. So done means that we consciously thought about or uh, uh, doing an action and set a plan or that we set something in motion to actually do the action. Okay, so there's more active participation uh, that's required for, a, for, uh, for an action to be done. And accumulated means that we had uh, the intention to act. Okay, so um, all virtuous and non-virtuous mental actions are accumulated because they're all intentions. Okay, so we got to be really careful about what we think. Um, so it's there's four possibilities between done and accumulated. There's actions that have been both done and accumulated, actions that have been done but not accumulated, actions that have been accumulated but not done, and actions that are neither. Okay. And so this will answer a lot of your questions, I think, about uh, the kind of karma uh, that's created with uh, many kind of situations we encounter in life. Okay, so karma that is done but not accumulated, okay, so it's actions that somehow have been set in motion or done, but, you know, we didn't have... Um, the, uh, the intention, a strong intention to do it, okay? So there's uh, 10 actions that are listed that are of this category, okay? So this helps us see how important the motivation is because if there's not a strong motivation and intention, you know, the ripening of those actions is, is going to be much more limited. So first of all, actions done in dreams. Yeah, people ask, ask, ask a lot about that. So it says, we dream of making offerings to the Buddha or of killing an enemy. If upon waking, we rejoice at virtuous actions in a dream, we create virtuous mental karma. If we regret them, the karma is non-virtuous. 
So if you have a dream, let's say, of making offerings, and then you wake up and you go, oh, that was a good dream. And, you know, I didn't make offerings, but it was a wonderful dream, and I wish I could, then that's virtuous. But if we dreamt we made offerings, and then we wake up and we say, oh, I dreamt I gave everything away. May I never do that? <laughs> uh, yeah, then that is a not a non-virtuous, a non-virtuous kind of regret. Okay, um, rejoicing at destructive actions in a dream creates non-virtuous mental karma. So you dream that somebody is, your enemy's chasing you and you turn around and whack him and kill him and then you wake up and you go, oh good, you know, I got that guy. That's non-virtuous because even though you didn't kill anybody, you know, you're rejoicing in killing. Whereas if you wake up and you think, oh, you know, I never want to do that kind of action, that was just a really bad dream, then that kind of attitude is, is um, you don't accumulate any negativity from that. And that's virtuous mental karma. Okay, so that kind of one type of action that is uh, done, but not accumulated. Uh, then the second one is actions done unknowingly. Okay, so for example, believing the art supplies on the table are for everybody to use, we take them without knowing that they in fact belong to a particular person. Okay, so that happens sometimes. You're living in a group situation and things are there and you assume it's for everybody and you use it but you didn't know that it actually belongs to an individual uh, and, you know, because that individual didn't put it away, you know, <laughs> okay. Um, actions done unconsciously. So we accidentally step on an insect without any kind of conscious intention. <coughs> okay, so those are done but not accumulated. They're not going to be very strong. There's no intention. Actions done without intensity or continuity. So we, uh, you know, make an offhanded uh, remark criticizing somebody, but it was just offhanded. It wasn't very strong. We didn't do again. Or we chit-chat for a while and then, you know, stop. So again, those actions aren't very strong. Yeah. So these kinds of actions are not going to ripen in a rebirth. They don't have the intensity to do that. Actions done mistakenly. So you wish to steal a book, but you steal a box instead. Okay, so you didn't, uh, uh, you know, get what, what you wanted. Or you intend to praise one person, which is virtuous, but you mistakenly praise another person. <laughs> Okay, so that, that virtuous karma isn't complete. Actions done forgetfully. So we tell a friend that we will not share their comments with others, and then we forget that we promise confidentiality, and we blabber. Okay, so that's due to our forgetfulness, not due to a bad intention. However, you know, when people ask us not to tell others, we should really try and remember that. You know, it's, it's not good to uh, betray people's confidentiality. Then actions uh, done unwillingly. So, uh, you know, you've been captured by, uh, a soldier's been captured by the enemy and then is forced to do some negative actions to kill someone or do something, okay? So actions where you are forced uh, to do them, yeah. So I guess it applies equally, you know, if you're a little kid and your parents force you to, uh, to save your allowance to give to charity and you resent it. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, that's not a good attitude as a kid. Hopefully you'll grow out of it. But, don't accumulate that virtuous karma. Um, eighth is actions that are ethically neutral. So walking, sweeping, cleaning, 
these kind of actions, we usually don't have a virtuous or non-virtuous motivation, so they're not going to ripen in a big result. Uh, this is where the thought training or mind training practice can be really useful tra for transforming neutral actions into something virtuous. So, for example, you know, you're, you're doing the dishes is a good example, okay, or vacuuming the floor, or whatever. So there's many different attitudes you can have when you vacuum or when you do the dishes. Yeah. So one could be, how come I have to clean up? This isn't fair. It's other people's turn, and I get stuck with it. So there's anger in the motivation. Then if you clean up, you're creating negativity. Okay. Or there could just be you're doing it, you're not thinking of anything in particular, then that becomes a neutral action, neutral karma. With mind training, then we specifically think something positive while we're cleaning. So we think, you know, may I clean away all the defilements of all living beings? And you think when you're washing the dishes or vacuuming the floor, that you're uh, helping to cleanse sentient beings' minds and thus freeing them from suffering. So that creates a virtue while you're, you know, doing the dishes or whatever. So you see, you know, there's all sorts of opportunities to create virtue during the day if we're aware and if we pay attention. Okay? So I really recommend uh, you know, when you get up in the morning on work days, to really generate, take a minute and, and generate a good motivation for going to work. Instead of just, you know, okay, it's Monday, I get up, I do my, my usual, you know, routine in the morning, and I get in the car, I get on the bus, I go to work, I do my work, I come home, uh, <laughs> okay? Or it's, it's, or you think, oh, I'm going to work, oh, this is really good, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to earn some money, and then this is what I'm going to buy with the money, and I'm going to do a good job, and then they'll give me a raise, and maybe I'll get a bonus, and, you know, then there's attachment, you're going to work with attachment, that's also not so good, okay? But if you really stop and think, you know, okay, I'm going to work, I'm going to offer service to living beings because everybody's job is in one way or, or another connected with offering service to living beings. Okay, so become aware of that. Yeah, Whether you're manufacturing something, whether you're in the service industry, whatever you're doing, is you're offering service to living beings. And so, you know, to think, may everybody who uses whatever it is I'm involved in doing or producing, may they be happy. Yeah, why not think that? Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I'm also going to work to uh, be kind to my colleagues and to create a good feeling in the workplace, too. So you generate that motivation and then that really helps you um, through the day and it changes the karma that you create. And it doesn't take long. Okay, ninth is um, actions eradicated through regret. So, uh, example is, although in general we speak truthfully, we lie to someone and later have strong regret. Okay, so that was, we lied, it was non-virtuous, but then we had strong regret afterwards. So that makes the intention uh, more neutral. Okay, or you make a donation to a charity and then afterwards you go, oh, why did I give so much? The family could have gone on vacation with that money. <laughs> then that's a negative kind of regret. You destroy the virtue you created from generosity. And then tenth, tenth is actions eradicated with a remedy. Okay, so seeing, for example, seeing the disadvantages of killing, we no longer wish to go fishing, hunting, or take the life of any living being. 
And in fact, we want to, we, and we do, take the precept against killing. Okay? Um, alternatively, uh, we weaken worldly attachments by attaining the states of concentration, or we eradicate the seeds of destructive actions by uh, um, directly perceiving emptiness. So these uh, eradicate the effects of karma through uh, uh, an actual remedy or an antidote. Okay? So those are about actions done but not accumulated. Okay? Then, karma that is both done and accumulated, okay, these are the actions that uh, mainly produce rebirth. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, when their four branches are complete. So these actions have six characteristics. <coughs> so the action is done deliberately, not impulsively, and uh, nor have we been coerced into doing it against <coughs> our will. So we had an intention, and we did the action according to our intention. Okay, you're mad at somebody, and you want to tell them off, and you open your mouth and do it. Okay, then all parts of the action are complete. So in that example, um, you know, you had the motivation, you identified who you wanted to tell off properly, you told them off, and at the end you said, good. Yeah, I stuck up for myself. I got that guy. Okay. Third. <laughs> It sounds awful, but this is what we do, isn't it? Yeah, we don't like to admit it, but we all do that. Right? Yeah. No, not me. <laughs> I don't do things. Why are you accusing me of doing that? I'm not accusing you. I'm just asking you to reflect on your actions. Okay, another action, another part that makes a karma uh, both done and accumulated is after we've done it, we don't regret the action. So we feel good about doing it. So that could be a virtuous action or a non-virtuous action, but we feel good about doing it. Yeah. Um, then the next part is we don't apply an antidote to counteract that karma. So we told somebody off. And it's like, I'm not going to apologize. I don't regret doing it. In fact, I'd like to do it again to that <laughs> person who's a beep, 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 beep. Okay? <laughs> uh, fifth is we rejoice in having done the action. And sixth uh, is the result is certain to happen. Okay? So we can see that there's ways, you know, to, to make the karma complete and to make it heavy and to make it incomplete so it doesn't ripen or, or to make it so the ripening is much, much lighter. Mm -hmm. So it's very important, you know, think about these things in your, uh, your uh, analytic meditation and make many examples from your life. And uh, look at things that you did over the day, you know, that day, and really analyze them in terms of these different branches. And then uh, that gives you a much better feel about karma. And we may want to, uh, you know, focus more on what our reaction is to our own negative karma. Yeah. Uh, so that we can weaken the, the way it ripens. Or we may find, uh, in reflecting on our daily actions, that there's certain motivations that come up uh, continually. Yeah, Some people uh, are very attached to uh, pleasurable sensory experiences, and so all day long, attachment is functioning, looking out for how can I experience some nice feeling you know, I want to eat nice food and see nice things and nice smells. And, 
you know, and the, the room has to be the right temperature for me, and the bed can't be too soft, and it can't be too hard, and uh, my clothes have to be, you know, the texture that feels good against my skin. And so you begin to say, oh boy, you know, a lot of my life energy, it revolves around keeping this body comfortable. And do I want to spend my life like that? Or you may find out that maybe a lot of your life energy is spent on, on making your body look good. Okay? You get up, you know, you put on your yoga clothes, and you do yoga, but you're dressed immaculately like a great yoga practitioner. <laughs> then you put on your gym clothes, which are stylish gym clothes, the expensive kind that let people know that, you know. Uh, and then you go to the gym, and you work out, you know, and you make sure that other people see how well you do the workout and how attractive your body is and you've slimmed down or you've fattened up whatever it is that you wanted to do and you know now look how great I look oh, oh, oh. Uh, yeah. okay and then you go home and change clothes again and now your body looks really good so you put on clothes that make you look good and then of course you know, uh, you go dye your hair, and the men dye their hair now too, even they dye their beard sometimes. And you know, if you don't have any hair, then you go and get some. <laughs> okay. Uh, you want to get some hair? No. <laughs> You're okay? <laughs> yeah, I think it's, a, it's, it's great too. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and then of course every year we have to change our glass frames so that we have the in-fashion glass frames. You know, we don't want to wear the old-fashioned glass frames, Ugh. you know. I had to get uh, new, new glasses uh, last year and I like the old ones and he couldn't, he really had to look all over to find a pair of the old frames, you know, because they fit me quite well, whereas the, the big, ugly ones, you know, uh, there are plenty of those, but they don't fit so well. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, so you get what I mean. We, we start to, to understand how we operate much better. Okay, uh, then the, uh, there's the talk about when karma ripens, okay? So, uh, definite karma, you know, that's been both um, uh, done and accumulated, it can uh, bear results in this life, in the next life, or in the second life onwards after the next life, okay? So, um, actions that ripen in this life are those that are very strong uh, due to the special quality of the field, the object that we uh, created the actions in relationship to, uh, or um, regarding the strength of our intention. So, for example, objects um, relating to human to uh, holy beings our spiritual mentors the buddha dharma sangha um, you know bodhisattvas and so on uh, those actions are going to be heavier whether they're virtuous or non-virtuous and those karmas can ripen in this life our actions done with a strong intention again can ripen in this life uh, uh, so it's mm, good to be careful Okay, then actions that um, ripen after that, okay, uh, so karmas are karmas that are less heavy, uh, so those are more likely to be experienced in future lives. Yeah. So uh, actually a great deal of the karmas that we create in this life, yeah, if they're not heavy, 
then they will ex be experienced in future lives. And similarly, a lot of the experiences we have this life is from karma created in previous lives that were not super heavy karmas, but maybe they were done repeatedly or whatever, and so we experience the, the effects in this lifetime. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Oh, so a sangha um, in his um, level of yogic deeds, Bodhi, uh, Yogacarya Bhumi, uh, he lists four pairs of actions that may ripen in the same life that those actions are created. So first, non-virtuous actions done with a strong attachment to our body and virtuous actions done with strong disinterest in our body. So what would be an, an example of a non-virtuous action done with strong attachment to our body? Plastic surgery. Mm -hmm. Plastic surgery. Oh, yeah, plastic surgery. Yeah. Adultery. Yeah. Adultery. Okay. What would be some example <coughs> of uh, non virtuous actions um, done with strong disinterest in our body? Self mutilation. No, self-mutilation isn't disinterest in our body, okay? It's, it's, it's actually quite interested in our body, yeah? There's a strong motivation that's going on there. Hmm? Smoking cigarettes? Well, again, that, I think, would be something non... Uh, with strong disinterest in our body. Um, I, it depends what they mean by disinterest. I was thinking that disinterest meant that we aren't attached to the physical comfort of the body. And so uh, we, uh, you know, that enables us to act more virtuously. Because yeah. smoking yeah, we are, uh, there's a lot of attachment involved in smoking. Yeah, we may be disinterested in our health, but we're very interested in the sensual pleasure our body experiences. So I was thinking, um, well, non-virtuous actions come with strong disinterest in the body. Going without sleep? Hmm? Deliberately going without sleep? Yeah, it could be deliberately going without sleep. Or, yeah, it might be self-mutilation, something like that. Because I'm thinking, because uh, it's non-virtuous. Yeah, I was thinking, oh, disinterest makes it virtuous. But no, this is explicitly non-virtuous. Okay. Yeah. Uh, then, okay, so these are, are likely to ripen in the same lifetime. Then non-virtuous actions done with great malice towards others. Oh, I'm sorry. I read this, the first one wrong. The first one is non-virtuous actions done with strong attachment to our body. So like you said, plastic surgery, smoking, that could be self-mutilation. It could be adultery, like you said and virtuous actions done with disinterest in the body. Okay, so that could be um, refraining from those actions. Dashing into a fire to save something. Yeah, yeah, there was a, um, a story last week about a, a kid running, a teenager running out of a house that was on fire, and then they heard a three-year-old cry out, and he ran right back in to get the child. Yeah. And they both wound up with severe bone burns, and they both wound up dying. Yeah, it was very sad. 
but it was like this teenager didn't think twice when he heard the toddler cry out. He just went back, right back in. So that would be, you know, a virtuous activity with disinterest in the body. In meditation? Huh? Meditation? Uh, yeah. Meditating. And, you know, not caring if your back hurts and your knees hurt and things like that. <laughs> Uh huh. And just at that example, if if that's a strong action to ripen in this lifetime, for example, that boy running back into the yeah. fire, his virtuous action ended in him burning to death. Right. So how has that ripened as a virtuous okay. action? Okay. This it doesn't mean that every virtuous action yeah. done with disinterest in the body will ripen in this life. Okay. It's just talking about tendencies for things. Clearly, if that kid was um, burned, there's no opportunity for that karma to ripen in this life. So it's not like his virtuous intention is going to overpower just the physical causality of body being in, in a fire, you know. So you have different systems of cause and effect operating here, and the virtuous intention is not going to put out the fire. Okay, but that kid died with a virtuous intention, you know, and a virtuous action, and that's going to bode very well for their future rebirth. Okay, so all these things about karma, they're they're stated in order to give us general ideas. But because karma is very complex and the ripening of anything depends on so many different factors, it's not that saying this one attribute of karma is going to overpower all the other factors. Okay? So, um, yeah, we have to really think about the complexity of, of karma. And that we may create a very strong virtue this life, but if there aren't the cooperative conditions for that virtue to ripen in this life, yeah. Let's say somebody was, you know, in Tibet before 1959, studying very hard, practicing very well, yeah. But then, the, you know, the Chinese took over Tibet. They had to flee. And there was no opportunity for a lot of that virtuous karma to ripen in this life because they became refugees. They had to go work on the roads in India or they had to live in extreme poverty where they continued to practice, you know. So, um, you know, for something to ripen, there have to be so many different condi uh, conditions around to make that ripen, okay? Uh, and this is where being able to make good decisions in this life strongly affects what karma will ripen and what won't. In the very first Dharma course I went to, um, I sat next to uh, a young woman named Teresa and we became friends. And she had been to Copan before and uh, you know she was encouraging me to go for the November course. The, because we were uh, in California at that time, the course, the first course I went to was in California. So, um, so we made a deal that we would both go to Copan, and when we got there, then um, she would take me out for a chocolate cake <laughs> in Kathmandu. Okay, so uh, you know this was the the big thing in those days was to get chocolate cake on Freak Street in Kathmandu. <laughs> okay. So, so I went to Copan, I got there, and I'm waiting for, you know, I got to be there before the course, I'm waiting for Teresa to come, and other people knew her, we're all waiting for Teresa to come. And the course starts, no Teresa, the course ends, no Teresa. What happened to Teresa? And then we learned, this was in the autumn of 1975, you might uh, recall, and you may not, that there was one French man 
in Thailand who was a serial murderer. Oh, okay. Do you remember? Yeah. So she was one of his victims. Oh, oh, she had gotten to Thailand on the plane. She went to a party. She met him at a party. He invited her out to lunch. She accepted the invitation. Okay, so here you see the decisions she made in that life. The decision to go to the party, the decision to go out to lunch with somebody who she didn't know very well. And the next thing was they found her body in a Bangkok canal. Okay, so she had some strong uh, karma, you know, to have an untimely death, to die early. Yeah. And the actions of going to the party and accepting his lunch invitation provided the external circumstances for that karma to ripen. If she hadn't had it, had gone to the party or accepted his invitation, that karma still would have been on her mind stream. Okay? But perhaps if she had gotten to Kopan, she would have done very strong purification that would have lessened the potency of that karma. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or if she hadn't, perhaps some other situation would come about where it would ripen. Okay? So you can see that what we, the decisions we make this lifetime influence what karma ripens. So when somebody drinks and drives, it's not just that the liquor can make you have an accident, but the liquor creates the conditions so that a previously created strong negative karma can ripen such that you get in an accident. Okay? So, um, yeah, so it behooves us to try and make good decisions in this lifetime so we don't put ourselves in situations where uh, non-virtuous karma from previous lives can easily ripen. Okay? But to put ourselves in situations where our virtuous karma can ripen. And even if non-virtuous karma ripens, it will, uh, we can see it as purification. Okay. So let's say Teresa hadn't, she just had gotten to Bangkok, changed planes, and got to Kathmandu. You know, she's at Kopan. Then, you know, more likelihood that some virtuous karma could ripen. Yeah? She's hearing teaching, she's getting more good imprints on her mind, and so forth. Uh, so that's something good that, that would have come about uh, due to that. Or even if she had gotten to Kopan, and let's say some other karma, not the karma for an untimely death, but some other no negative karma had ripened, and she got the flu, yeah, because we most of us got the colds and the flu there, okay, or dysentery, yeah, more common than, than the cold and the flu or dysentery, yeah. So you get diarrhea, you get dysentery, and then, and then you think, yeah. So that's a ripening of negative karma, but you think, oh, now my karma is purifying. Yeah, I'm glad this negative karma is ripening. Yeah. It could have ripened in a horrible rebirth, but now it's ripening in diarrhea or a cold or whatever it is. Okay. So if you think like that when you're undergoing some suffering, it has uh, the effect of purifying some of the uh, harmful karma that we've created before. Okay. And so it, it's a very good way to think. And it completely changes your mind so that instead of feeling sorry for yourself for being sick, you think, actually, I got off easy. <laughs> yeah, Because when we think sometimes of this life, uh, in this life, who knows what we've done previous life, 
but even this life, the nasty things we've done. Yeah, and then we have some suffering like getting a cold or diarrhea. And it's like, oh yeah, I did get off easy, you know. And I'm, I'm you know, it's fine. I'm sick, that's fine. Uh, I'm not going to complain. I'll recover and life will go on. Okay, And so that has, that lessens your suffering right now due to the illness. And it... Uh, creates some virtuous karma or, or counteracts the non-virtue. Okay. Okay. So other things that can ripen in the same life that they're created. Non-virtuous actions done with great malice towards others. And virtuous actions done with heartfelt compassion for them. So what would be some examples of non-virtuous actions done with great malice towards others? <laughs> Your lines are blank. <laughs> yeah, you don't read the newspaper. <laughs> what are some examples? Domestic violence. Kids. What? Domestic violence. Violence against another person. Yeah, violence against another person, yeah. Violence against yeah. Gang warfare. Yeah, domestic violence, like beating somebody up in a bar, and you know, who knows what. Okay. Um, yeah. How about virtuous actions done with heartfelt compassion for them? What are some examples? Helping a sick person. Yeah, helping, helping a sick person who can't take care of themselves. Not because you feel obliged to, but because you really care about them. Okay, okay more uh, actions that may ripen. Non-virtuous actions done with deep malice and lack of respect for the three jewels or our spiritual mentors. And virtuous actions done with deep deep confidence and regard for them. So what are some examples of non-virtuous actions done with deep malice and lack of respect for the three jewels or for our spiritual mentors? Stealing statues and selling them on the black market? Yeah, stealing, stealing statues, stealing things from the altar, selling these things on a black market on the black market to, you know, make money for yourself. Mm. Yeah. What are examples of uh, virtuous actions done with D3 jewels and our spiritual mentors? Volunteering for the community? Or yeah. Sangha? Yeah. Volunteering mm. to, uh, at a monastery, at a Dharma center, because you really uh, want to see the Dharma grow. Then, non-virtuous actions done with intense animosity towards those who have been kind to us, such as parents and teachers, and virtuous actions done with an intense wish to repay their kindness. Elder abuse. Huh? Elder abuse? For the first Elder time. abuse? Yeah. yeah, that's a good one. Well, a bad one. But, <laughs> you know intense animosity towards those who have been kind to us. Yeah. So kids who, uh, you know, are like planning for their parents to die so that they can get the inheritance, yeah, don't really care about their parents' welfare. Virtuous actions done with an intense wish to repay their kindness. The reverse of that. Care yeah, care caring for them. Yeah, doing what you can. So I uh, heard an example of uh, something happening that was quite disturbing to me. Um, in another Buddhist tradition, not the Tibetan tradition, but another one, uh, there had been an elder nun who had ordained many, you know, several students, and uh, she was the elder nun uh, was living with some of those students but gradually they all went to other places where they could 
learn more and do more. And they left her alone in her 80s without an attendant, without anybody caring for her. Yeah, so that would be an example of this. And when I heard about that, I was just appalled. Yeah. Um, <coughs> because the, the people who uh, give us our precept, our Dharma teachers, are very precious to us. Okay. So in general, the results of heavy constructive and destructive karmas may be experienced in the same life in which they were created, whereas karmas that are slightly less heavy are likely to be experienced in the very next life, and karmas that are not as heavy as those are experienced in lives after that. But that's just a general thing, because it could be, let's say, that we create a lot of heavy karma in this life, some virtuous, some non-virtuous. At the time of death, a dharma friend is around, reminding us of our dharma practice, of our teachers, of the three jewels, that makes it so that we have a virtuous mental state. So um, a virtuous karma ripens at the end of this life, and we have a good rebirth in next lifetime. Yeah, But then still that heavy non-virtue is still on our mind stream. So then let's say at the end of our next lifetime, yeah, um, we're in a hospital, and they're... Uh, the TV's on and they have a war movie on or, you know, Spider-Man movie on and there's all this violence and people zapping each other and you're dying in the middle of it. <laughs> yeah, because nobody turns off the TV. And all your relatives are around you and they're screaming at each other and blaming each other. Yeah, and then that create, you know, stirs you up, and then that could make the non-virtuous karma ripen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So then, yeah, then just to, uh, to mention, Oh, there's what we call projecting karma and um, completing karma. So projecting karma is the karma that pushes us towards a rebirth, and completing karma is, uh, are all the various kinds of karma that ripen the create uh, different circumstances in, uh, in that rebirth, okay? So for example, at our abbey, uh, our monastery, we have four kitties. Okay. <laughs> These kitties are, uh, would we say pampered? <laughs> That's putting it mildly. <laughs> okay? So, you know, they were born in the animal realm. That is a result of non-virtuous projecting karma. But they have plenty to eat, they are petted. They have these, one of our nuns makes the most comfortable beds for these cats to sleep in, you can't imagine. They are walked every day, almost, on a leash, you know. Um, yeah, you can walk cats on a leash. Uh, yeah, it's tricky, but it can be done. Um, you know, these cats don't lack for anything. So they have non-virtuous, their life is a result of non-virtuous um, projecting karma, but a very virtuous completing karma. Yeah, because they, they live. They also listen to teachings. Huh? Oh, they also, yes, of course. When we have teachings in the uh, hall where they live, because they don't go to all the buildings because some people are allergic to cats, but in the one building where they live, uh, they all come to teachings when we have teachings in that building. Yeah. So we make sure we do roll call. <laughs> yeah. My tree. Meow. 
So they're very, very fortunate kitties. Okay. Then you could have somebody who has non-virtuous throwing karma, okay, and non-virtuous completing karma. So uh, that would be, for example, if you've ever been to uh, Dharmasala, the donkeys in Dharmasala, okay? So being born in, in an animal realm, result of non-virtuous projecting karma, and then these donkeys, it's horrible, it just breaks my heart, you know? They're, they put these bags of rocks on their back, they have to climb up the hill, it's a hilly area, with these rocks. Um, you know, they have a ring through their nose and somebody's either pulling that ring or beating them from behind. Okay, so that would be an example of non-virtue for both the throwing and the completing. Okay, then there's, um, then there's virtuous uh, throwing karma and non-virtuous uh, completing karma. So that would be somebody who has a good rebirth, let's say, as a human being. So that's a result of the virtuous uh, throwing or projecting karma. But uh, they're born in extreme poverty, okay? Or they're born in a country torn by war. So, you know, being born in Syria these days, for example, yeah? And so that's non-virtu, that's virtuous um, throw, projecting, non-virtuous completing. And then there is virtuous projecting and virtuous completing. And I think we have, by and large, those. Okay? We have a fortunate rebirth and we, you know, we don't have great suffering in our lives. Although our minds like to make up suffering. <laughs> yeah, don't we? Yeah, we have some small problem and we magnify it. So it is enormous. And we never think of, you know, somebody living in Syria, why they're bombing Syria. Okay, and compared to that person who doesn't know if they're gonna have a home that evening or not, or a family that evening. You know, our little problem is minuscule, and yet our mind makes it into natu national tragedy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my mother, when, when I would do that as a kid, you know, kind of whine or cry about something, and she would say, be quiet or I'll give something I'll give you something to cry about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, ha having been the recipient of her having given me that gift before uh, I decided uh, okay my problem isn't so big. <laughs> you know? Or I'll go to my room and whine, I won't whine in front of her. <laughs> Okay, then there's um, naturally non-virtuous actions and uh, actions and prescribed actions. So this is, this is rather interesting, okay? So karma is also divided into naturally non-virtuous actions and actions prescribed by the Buddha. Mm -hmm. Those that are naturally non-virtuous, such as the ten non-virtues that we talked about yesterday, are so called because they are done with a non-virtuous motivation, their nature is non-virtuous, and they have the potential to produce <coughs> suffering results. And so almost every ordinary being who does those actions has a non-virtuous intention. Okay? So whoever does that action, whether that person is a monastic or a lay person, they create non-virtue. And they also create negativity and will experience unpleasant results. 
Okay, so you create non-virtue and you create negativity. Those two are not exactly the same. It'll become clearer. Then actions prescribed by the Buddha are those regulated by precepts, such as the Pratimoksha precepts of a monastic. Okay, so when we take uh, our monastic ordination, then we voluntarily undertake the precepts that the Buddha set out. Yeah, or when lay people take the five lay precepts, those are also Pratimoksha precepts, uh, then they also assume those action, uh, those precepts and, which were regulated by the Buddha. Okay, so some of these actions are naturally non-virtuous and do not necessarily, uh, wait a minute, oh, some of these actions are not naturally non-virtuous and do not necessarily involve an afflictive motivation. They may also be done with a neutral or constructive motivation. Okay, so examples of things, let's say for monastics, that are precepts, uh, we take precepts not to engage in doing. So some of those actions, such as killing, stealing, and so on, are naturally non-negative. Plus, there are things prescribed by the, the, the Buddha. So we, uh, we accumulate, if we break those, we accumulate the non-virtue and the negativity. Okay? But then there's other uh, precepts that we have as monastics. For example, uh, to not sing or dance or play music. Okay? Those activities are not naturally non-virtuous. They can also be done with a virtuous intention or a neutral intention. Okay? Um, eating after midday, handling money, those are also um, ones that are not naturally non-virtuous. However, okay, as a monastic, if we do those actions, we accumulate the negativity because we have contradicted one of the precepts that we took that was established by the Buddha. Then, it also matters with what kind of motivation we did that activity. So, let's say, let's take singing, for example. We have a precept not to sing. Yeah. But you see that we often chant mantra. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, you could say that's a form of singing. So, but if we do that, with a mind of, of faith and devotion, okay, and then it, it, the action may be virtuous, but there's still, you know, we contradicted that precept, okay? Or you could sing, you know, you really like rap music, and you start, you know, getting into the rap music, and, uh, you know, you like your voice, and you want to show up your voice, and and uh, gain some attention to yourself because you have such a good voice or whatever, then your motivation becomes non-virtuous. Yeah, so the action was neutral, but uh, the power of our motivation made it non-virtuous. So then you accumulate the non-virtue and the negativity. Okay? Yeah. So when those who, can, who hold monastic precepts transgress a precept, they commit an offense or a downfall by engaging in the action prescribed by the Buddha. To purify this, they must confess and apply the appropriate method as prescribed in the Vinaya. For this reason, it is very important for monastics to attend a posada rite with four or more fully ordained monastics. So posada is, uh, the Tibetan is sojom, and it is, uh, it happens uh, fortnightly, and we come together as a community, four or more fully ordained people, and we confess our, our breaches and negativities to each other, and then we recite our precepts together, okay? So it's very important if you're ordained to do that, because otherwise, you know, you may, uh, you know, chant your mantra, eat at night, sometimes put on lay clothes or whatever, 
but you don't go and purify those those transgressions and then that's not so good you know you have to go and confess those things and then purify them the the breach you know the category of precepts is then there's different ways of making amends okay so there's uh, one category of precepts they they're called sangatha sessa or remainder they're called remainders because you still have your ordination, but you really did something that's pretty awful. That, if you don't watch it, will endanger your ordination. Okay? So, uh, those, if we want to purify them, then there's a period of, of uh, penance in which we temporarily relinquish our monastic privileges. We usually have 35 privileges as fully ordained people. We relinquish those for the duration of the penance time. And then there is uh, a manata, uh, the manata, the rehabilitation ceremony, uh, whereby you have to have big groups of monastics come to reinstate you. Yeah, And it's a real pain in the neck. <laughs> yeah. The other monastics, you know, there has to be a lot of them. Their study and everything gets interrupted. They have to come together, do this whole ceremony. Meanwhile, during your penance time, you have to go and confess every day. You sit at the end of the line. You relinquish your, your privileges. And so just because it's such a pain in the neck, it is a good um, uh, motivation not to do those actions. Mm -hmm. okay. But that's what has to be done to be, you know, to be reinstated. There's another... Um, class of, uh, of um, transgressions, they're called forfeiture lapses, and this is when we obtain some material possession for our livelihood, but not through correct livelihood, through incorrect livelihood. So this could include having more than the requisite number of robes, it could include misusing somebody's donation to us. They gave us a donation for one purpose, we use it for another. Uh, there's all sorts of ways to do this. Um, so if you commit one of those, then again, it's, it's kind of a pain in the neck for the Sangha, but a little bit less pain in the neck. <laughs> but it is very embarrassing, because whatever you got that you, weren't, that you didn't get through the right livelihood, you have to give up in front of the Sangha so everybody sees it. And then they give it back to you and you feel totally embarrassed. <laughs> okay, so that also is a good motivation. <laughs> okay, then there's other uh, actions where we can confess to one, uh, you know, actions that aren't so strong, where we can confess to one, uh, uh, you know, to one another, to one other monastic, yeah. And so, uh, but then we have to go to the posada, the sojung ceremony, and recite the precepts together in the community. Okay. Okay. Then... Okay, we're going to skip that because we're running a lot of time. Then there's purification. Okay, so um, okay, so there's a passage in one of the sutras. I, you know, I've always wondered where the four uh, opponent powers. You know, we hear about that so much, and I was always thinking, what's the source for that? Finally found it. There's a sutra called the Sutra Showing the Four Dharmas. Or Chatur Dharma Niradesha Sutra. Okay? And so uh, in it, there's a passage that says, Maitreya, when a Bodhisattva Mahasattva possesses these four powers, they will overcome any negativities they have done and accumulated. <clears throat> what are they? They are the power of regret, the power of the antidote, the power of resolve, and the power of reliance. 
Okay? So, the power of regret is regretting whatever non-virtue we have done. Regret is very different from guilt. Okay? We have to be very clear about this. And we have to be able to identify what regret feels like in our mind and what guilt feels like in our mind. Okay? When we feel guilty, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, yeah, uh, because our, our culture is really a guilt culture, we think, I'm so terrible, I'm so awful, how could I have done that? This was just despicable. Something's really wrong with me. I don't want anybody to know because if they know that I did this, <clears throat> nobody will like me. And it's, there's a lot of very negative self-talk. Okay, that's guilt. Yeah, sound familiar? Yeah. Regret is simply, I made a mistake, I regret it. Okay. There's not all this, I'm such a terrible person, I'm unworthy, I'm bad, blah, blah, blah. Okay? Guilt is extremely self-centered. It's all about me and how terrible I am. Regret is not self-centered. Regret is, I made a mistake and I wish I hadn't done that. Okay? So they're very, very different. And an example I like to give, so you can really see the difference, is you know the stoves that have uh, the electric burners? Mm -hmm. And the electric burner can be hot, but you don't know it. Mm -hmm. And if you actually accidentally touch the burner, do you feel regret or do you feel guilt? <laughs> you feel regret, don't you? You don't feel guilty. So that's the difference between them. Okay? So we want to feel regret. Yeah. And we want to regret our non-virtues, but we don't want to regret our virtuous actions. Okay? So here we have to really think about our motivation, why we did something, you know, have a feeling of regret for it. Uh, think, and here too, it's very helpful to think about how in the world did I get myself into that situation where I did that action? You know, what was I thinking? What was going on in my mind? What was the external situation? Uh, you know, how did I wind up doing this? And in that way, uh, we can start to see, you know, what psychological mechanisms are operating of attachment, of anger, of uh, belligerence, of shame, or whatever. All these kinds of negative <coughs> mental factors. And we can see them more clearly, and, uh, because they're the ones that motivated our negative actions. And then we can start learning the antidotes to those uh, non-virtuous mental factors. Okay, and that's very helpful because as we learn the antidotes and as we think, uh, you know, if I were ever in that situation again, how would I like to behave this time instead of what I did last time, then that also helps us really uh, prepare and think of alternative behaviors and alternative motivations. Okay? So that's, um, so Shanti Deva in uh, his, Bodhi, in his uh, Guide to a Bodhisattva's Way of Life, he, he, one way in which he expresses regret, here are some verses, it's very helpful for us. Since beginning of this cyclic existence in this life and in others, Unknowingly, I committed negativities and caused them to be done by others. Overwhelmed by mistakes of ignorance, I rejoiced in what was committed. But now, seeing these mistakes from my heart, I confess them to the three jewels, the protectors. Okay, then second is we perform according to the, the list in this sutra. 
Um, then there's the power of the antidote. And so this is some kind of remedial action that we do to counteract the harmful action we did. So that could be reciting, studying, and so on, different sutras or dharma teachings, meditating on emptiness, uh, reciting mantras, reciting the names of the Buddhas, bowing to the Buddhas like you do during the uh, prostration practice to the 35 Buddhas, uh, making offerings, making Buddha images, um, yeah, creating altars, uh, yeah, and things like this, okay? Volunteering, yeah, volunteering at the Dharma Center, at the monastery, volunteering at a charity, any kind of virtuous action can be a remedial action here. Okay, then uh, the third opponent power is that we make a strong determination to uh, abandon such actions in the future. So there are some actions where we can look at them and say, I will never do that again. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I did that. I do not want ever, ever, ever to act that way. And we can say clearly, you know, visualizing the Buddhas, I will not do that again. Then there are other actions. Can we really truthfully say we'll never gossip again? <laughs> Can we really truthfully say that we'll never say harsh words to somebody again? Those are a little bit harder, aren't they? So there, what's advised is instead of saying, I will never do them again, is pick a time period that you think you can uh, do, go through that time period without doing that action. You know, so it may be, yeah, from now until the end of the day, I will not talk behind somebody else's back. Maybe you can't promise what you're going to do tomorrow, but at least <laughs> today. Maybe you feel more confident. You say, from now for a week, I'm not going to talk behind it, anybody's back. And then the power of making that kind of determination is that then our... Uh, introspective awareness and our mindfulness increase because we've said we won't do that and so then we keep checking up on our mind and our speech and our physical actions to make sure we don't do that. Okay. And then the last of the four opponent powers is, uh, it's called in the sutra, the power of reliance. Um, what this means is that uh, we develop a different attitude towards whoever it was that we harmed. So we're, re you know, it's called reliance in the, in the sense that we're relying on the people or whatever it was that we harmed, but now we're creating a different attitude. So for example, if we created negativity, uh, against the three jewels, we, you know, we're taking things from the altar or whatever, then the, the power of reliance would be taking refuge in them. If we were really mean to other people and uh, shredded their reputation behind their back or we lied to them or slept around or whatever, then uh, the, it would be to generate love and compassion and bodhicitta towards whoever it was that we harmed. Okay? So it's really a shift in our whole attitude. So you can really see that uh, to purify something, it's not just a simple thing of saying, I'm sorry. We have to actually change our attitude towards whoever it was that we harmed. Yeah. So we have to go back and do some work on ourselves to change that attitude. But in order to do that, we have to regret it first. And then we have to make a, also make a determination to try and not do that action again in the future. Okay? And do some remedial behavior and change our attitude.
Okay, and so if we do that powerfully and continuously, then it's uh, what it starts to do is it lessens the effect of the negative action. So maybe something that ha would have resulted in a very severe illness, instead we get a cold. Or something that would have resulted in long-term pain, instead we stub our toe and it's short-term pain. Something like that, okay? So it begins to impede the ripening of the karma. Only when we realize emptiness directly do we start to uh, remove the karmic seeds from our mind stream. Okay? So may we all do that. <laughs> so, time's up. <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe we can do one or two questions, that's it, otherwise. You know, we're already at noon. Anything? Nothing? Yeah. Um, you talked yesterday about the karmic system, but then other systems like biological systems, geological systems. Uh -huh. So we create our karma through our actions. Mm -hmm. What creates the geological systems and the biological systems? Yeah. Are well, those are just the natural functioning of the elements. Yeah. There's no outside creator who creates them. That's just the way they naturally function and relate to each other. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, if someone's uh, experiencing mental health problems in this life, can that be um, uh, related to karma in a previous mm -hmm. life? Yeah, it could be related to um, you know, maybe somebody who was very aggressive in a previous life, then this life becomes kind of paranoid. They suffer from a lot of fear and suspicion and paranoia. Okay? So you can see there's some kind of connection you cause that in somebody else, then, then you experience that kind of thing yourself in another lifetime. I feel a, a bit uh, confused about some of the messages about karma mm -hmm. um, and uh, you, I was very struck by the fact that you came out publicly and said that you don't like President Trump. Um, I don't like him either and I adore <laughs> Obama and his wife. But what were your motivations in doing that? I don't like his policies. Yes, but yeah. were you trying to warn us or to... <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't think I need to warn you. But you <laughs> needed to tell us that. You're here as our teacher. You're in a very powerful yeah. position. And yeah. No, it, that wasn't uh, something meant to instruct you on politics or anything, mm -hmm. you know. I, I don't believe that religious leaders should tell people who to vote for. No, <laughs> but uh, you expressed a, a, a strong opinion and uh, I sort of feel almost uh, uh, culpably paranoid after hearing all this stuff about uh, karma, you know, that you feel as if the next step you're going to do something wrong. And I can see that it's okay to, to express a, a strong negative opinion about somebody. Mm -hmm. That isn't gossip or mm -hmm. it's, uh, you, you know what I mean? I, it's hard for me to distinguish. It's, okay. What, what I was doing, yes. you know, if I said, I don't like, pre I don't know that I, did I say it in those yes. words, I don't like President Trump? Yes. Or did I say I don't like his actions? You said you didn't like him. Did I? Did I say that directly yes. to about the person? Yes. Okay, so that was my mistake. I should have said, I don't like his actions. Okay, because I gave you that whole talk about separating the person and the action, and then I did it myself. Okay. Confusion in your eyes. Yes. So, I, I confess that. Okay. 
you know, I don't like his actions. Yes. Yeah, the person has Buddha nature. I also feel a lot of compassion for him. Yes. Because I look at him and he's clearly somebody who's extremely unhappy. Yes. And extremely unfulfilled. Yes. You know, so I have to have compassion for yeah. him. I don't have, you yeah. know, if I said I don't like him, it doesn't mean I want to go beat the guy up. No. <laughs> okay? No. Thank you for clarifying. Okay, good. Thank you for calling me on. <laughs> oh, I didn't mean to find fault. I, I was just confused and needing clarification. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. just one more thing. Um, uh, it's very easy to become um, to lose confidence and become a little bit anxious with a lot of the um, teachings, particularly around karma, what's what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad, all that sort of stuff. Um, what what um, I think I'm sort of can't get into a place where I can better handle that. Sometimes I just let it go and just do my best. Um, but to to uh, I'm not sure what my question is, but. To gain, um, um, sorry, you mentioned the other day sometimes people um, ask too much from the teachers and you know, um, relying too much on their wisdom and to develop their own wisdom. Mm -hmm. And I guess in that journey, what are the things that you can uh, recommend to overcome some of your lack of confidence and anxiety to become a you know, more sturdy? Mm -hmm. student or practitioner. Okay. Um, study and think about what you learn. Yeah? Because if you study it, then you think about it, you develop your own wisdom. Does this make sense? Does this not make sense? What are examples that describe whatever it was you study? Are there any counter examples that you know, contradict what you've learned in the teachings? Okay, so think about the teachings yourself, and then in that way you will develop your own wisdom. And if you come to a different conclusion than what the teachings say, then check with somebody and see if you've understood the teachings correctly. Because lots of times we misunderstand the teachings, and then that creates a lot of confusion in our mind and we get very perturbed inside. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so ask questions, think about things yourself, investigate, um, read multiple sources. Okay? Yeah. Does that answer your question okay? Yeah, I think it's just looking for some reassurance. The mm -hmm. times when the, the confidence is low. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, that's kind of natural when we begin to study it. It's like, whoa, there's a lot to learn here. And some of it goes in easily, and some of, it, some of it our mind fights against. Yeah, I know that was certainly the experience with me. And so those things that my mind fights against, I have to really uh, ask myself, am, am I understanding them correctly? Okay, I'll give you an example. Okay. In one of the practices I do, uh, it, 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 you know, in relating to uh, our spiritual mentor, there's a, a line that says, may I only do what pleases you. Okay? So, in relationship to the spiritual mentor, in relationship to the Buddha, may I only do what pleases you. Well, that line, maybe that line for you is perfectly all right. For me, that line pushed my buttons like crazy, okay? Because to me, it sounded like God setting the rules and I have to be a good girl and somehow figure out what the rules are even though they aren't so clear and then conform this dictates about what I should do and not do, and in that way I please them. So that's how I was thinking about that. And I was so, at, you know, I would get so agitated. And this is a very important practice that we do every day. And I'm like, oh, I can't say that. I said, oh, why should I please, you know, why should I have to please the Buddha? This day, Buddha's not God. I didn't come here to worship another God. Um, 
Okay. And then, as I thought about it, so I struggled with it, with this for a long time. And then I, I thought about it more and more and more, and it's like, well, what is the Buddha's deepest wish for sentient beings? That we have happiness in its causes. Okay, that makes sense. Who creates the causes for our happiness? We do. When we create the causes for our own happiness, does that fulfill the Buddha's wish for us to have happiness in its causes? Yes. So, if I'm doing what is pleasing the Buddha, what I'm basically doing is creating the causes of happiness for myself and for other living beings. Do I think that's a bad thing to do? No. <laughs> Is anybody forcing me to do that? No. no. Yeah. Did somebody else make that rule? No. And so I realized I was, you know, completely projecting something on that line in the text that didn't have to be there. Okay, what I was projecting was a misunderstanding. Yeah. But it took me a long time to, um, to really figure that out. Okay? Okay, let's sit quietly for a couple of minutes. And then I'll dedicate.